Hey, power people. Welcome to Renewable Rides. I'm Gareth Evans. And I'm Dan Roberts. We're the founding team of Vecta, a platform and marketplace streamlining how companies buy on-site energy. In each episode, we'll uncover the latest trends, challenges, and triumphs relating to the energy transition through the experiences of our team and our inspiring guests. Our goal is to help companies take action to create a resilient, profitable, sustainable, and thriving energy future. Let's go. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Renewable Rides. And Dan, it's awesome to be back doing these one-on-ones and uh, exploring what we're hearing in the market. Yeah, no, it's good to be back. It's uh, been a week and a half or so since we did our last recording. Been a been a bit of a wild last week or, or so for me. I was uh, traveling in in South Florida at a at an awesome energy conference, but uh, I got caught up in the in the intense rainstorm that happened last week. Twelve inches fell in uh, in a single day, nineteen and a half over the two day period in uh, in Aventura, Florida, about halfway between Fort Lauderdale and Miami. Um, so uh, luckily, I didn't have to leave where I was at and experience all the flooding, but a lot of people that I was around were, were uh, greatly impacted. And I know a lot of the communities around there were impacted. So um, good to be back home here in California. How about yourself, Gareth? Yeah, it's uh, it's really good to be back. For me, it's just a big shout out to all the dads out there. It was uh, Father's Day this last weekend. Had a blast hanging out with Melanie. They got to both do races. Mel came second in a duathlon. Ethan did his first ever five kilometer and uh, did it in 28 minutes. So for a 10-year-old nipper, he did awesome. It was great seeing him challenge his limits. And uh, yeah, it tees us up for today. And very excited today to talk about how do we maximize our energy transition opportunity by taking a portfolio view. And this is a, a very common question we get from our customers. So the purpose of this is to help you work through these pain points and challenges and understand what's possible. So today, what are we hearing from our customers with respect to having a large portfolio of facilities and knowing where to begin? How are we determining current status is important and how do we constantly refine this to prioritize the best projects? And then how do we at Vector approach this situation ourselves? So what are we hearing from our customers, Dan? Yeah. The, uh, the, I mean, the big thing that we're hearing is that rates are going up and they don't know what to do. They're getting, you know, their finance team is coming to them saying, Hey, we're, we're, our costs have gone up 20, 30, 40%. Um, how do we go about, uh, addressing this? Um, we've heard from, from one customer in particular who was, is you know, adamant about going on this, on this energy transition journey and, and was an early starter, uh, started a couple of years ago, but that in order to get to a baseline of where they understood what their opportunity was across 40 large industrial sites, it took them about two years to pull together the, the data to understand where there might be opportunities, understand all the nuances and the, the differences between all the sites, which, um, every site is going to be different. We'll, we'll touch on that a bit more here in a second. Um, Gareth, any, any other things that you're hearing in the market? Yeah, I think uh, the big one is um, I have this really big facility in my portfolio and it's consuming a huge amount of energy. I've gone really deep on that opportunity and I don't feel like there's a, an exciting business case because I've got no spare real estate or I can only offset a portion of my energy consumption. So maybe on-site energy isn't for me. And I think this is quite a big misrepresentation of the opportunity, but we see that being the natural inclination for many of our customers is obviously that's where I should start. I should always start with the biggest energy consuming facility, but depending on where it's located and your business priorities, that may not be the case. And we'll talk a bit more about that. And the last one is um, many of our customers complain about receiving lots of inbound inquiries from suppliers trying to sell them a particular solution. And um, for our customers, the question always is, is this the right solution that I'm being sold? Um, should I consider it further? Is this right for me? Should I be considering other technologies or the suppliers? So I think all this sets the right framework for um, assessing the opportunities across your portfolio. Yeah, and one other thing I wanted to add is uh, there are a lot of different um, companies, firms, organizations out there that are supporting clients to go on this journey, whether they be the big uh, management consulting firms that we hear about, the large commercial real estate advisory firms, 
where this problem is magnified because while this problem is 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 very complex for an individual company that has 50, 100, 500, several thousand sites, because each site is unique, um, Let's amplify that even further for the advisory firms that are supporting hundreds of those companies that have 200 sites. Um, and how do they help those clients navigate? And how do they, rather than just throwing bodies at it, really, really uh, ensure that they are maximizing the opportunity? So that's another thing that we're, we're seeing out there is not just the, the companies that have large portfolios themselves, but it's the companies that are supporting those companies as well. Yeah. Or those that are demanding their suppliers to address their emissions and energy costs because they're part of the supply chain to address their scope three commitments. You know, these are big, complex portfolio level um, challenges um, that are not immediately obvious. And I think a big part of this is, you know, trying to determine the opportunity across a portfolio is challenging because there's a saying that once you've seen one microgrid, you've seen one microgrid. And this is because not all projects are created equal. And um, it's not quite as bad as that. You know, there are consistencies across opportunities. But the reality is, for your business, for every one of your facilities, you have unique business needs and objectives. Now, for your corporate commitments, is your commitment to reduce costs? Is it to increase operational reliability? Increasing reliability may only be at some of your facilities because outage risk may be greater in Texas or Florida versus um, up in Oregon or Washington. So across even your facility portfolio, um, your priorities are going to be different. Is it to reduce emissions? And is it to reduce emissions across the whole portfolio or in certain uh, jurisdictions? And what does success look like for you as an organization? Is it based on internal rate of return? Is it on those carbon reductions? Is it you want to see carbon reductions, but you don't want to see your energy costs go up? Are you willing to pay a premium for those cost uh, emission reductions? And then maybe it's um, how do I mitigate my risk of these escalating energy costs and just lock in my costs for the next 20 years? So the business priorities and objectives are very different. Once you've determined what your priorities are, you then got to look at your specific sites because every location is going to have its particular needs and objectives. And Dan, do you want to talk about some of the, the dynamic um, opportunities around each facility? Absolutely. The challenge is, is, is really magnified when you zoom in at a local level. And um, again, we're talking about companies that have facilities scattered across a large geography, whether that be uh, across a, a region of the U.S., across the, all of the U.S., internationally and, and multinational companies, um, which which amplifies this problem even further. And so some of the things that, that come into consideration when, when zooming in at a local level is um, the rates or the tariffs. So what are the what are the tariff structures? What are the rates? But cross energy charges and demand charges both today and and what are they expected to be over time? I think we've hit on this on a couple previous episodes, but uh, load growth is increasing. It's been pretty flat over the last twenty plus years, but that's increasing, and so that's gonna and it's and it's not increasing equally across uh, across the U.S. and across the world, and that's gonna change uh, uh, prices and and rates over time. Uh, the the renewables potential so. The sun doesn't shine as hard or, or in, in uh, industry speak, the irradiance is not as strong everywhere, uh, just the same way that the wind doesn't blow everywhere. Uh, and, and then as you, as you expand that beyond renewables, fuel prices are different uh, in, in uh, different locales. And so these are important considerations to make. Uh, you can then look into, and a really important factor in these is, is the incentives. Uh, the incentives uh, play a big role in, in um, uh, strengthening business cases, making a, a, a project that might be kind of on the fence of, of financial viability and take it over the line. And, and some key uh, aspects I'd point out here in the U.S. is with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, the energy community tax credit bonus. So with the Inflation Reduction Act, the, the investment tax credit, there are bonuses. One of the key bonuses, because it is statutory, meaning if you if you fall into one of these zones and you're eligible, it's you, you're going to get it, is the energy community uh, tax credit bonus. And just this year alone, 
the maps or the uh, eligible locations has changed twice mm -hmm. from the 2023 uh, uh, guidance from, from the IRS. And so it's important to stay on top of these. Uh, another uh, interesting one is, is the REAP grants, um, which is uh, put out by the USDA um, and it's for um, rural projects. And so it's another area to determine whether or not you're eligible and, and whether or not you want to pursue uh, that type of grant. Then uh, for those that are on a decarbonization uh, pathway, uh, understanding the grid carbon intensity. So how, quote unquote, dirty is, is the grid that I'm consuming my electricity from? Um, and not all locations are created equal. Uh, you look at uh, a place like Washington State, tremendously clean uh, uh, power. Oh, they've got a ton of hydro. It's very cheap. Uh, and and so companies that are, are decarbonizing up there uh, already have it really good because it's uh, it's actually a rather clean grid. Whereas places like Louisiana or even maybe a more surprising place like Colorado are pretty coal heavy and therefore high carbon and there and therefore your your scope two emissions are going to be higher there. And then the last and certainly not the least, arguably the, the most critical uh, to consider is the outage risk. And, and outage risk, while your facility may or may not have been impacted by an outage, it's important to look at uh, the historical outages at, in that region um, and then start to, to project ahead what that might look like based on, on um, uh, grid uh, transmission and distribution age and the strains on the grid, not to mention the, the obvious ones around um, natural disasters, wildfires, hurricanes, and, and all of that. So um, those are some, some really key ones. Then from there, moving into, into operations. So at an individual facility, how do you consume energy? Meaning how much, what's the load profile and the shape of that consumption look like? Um, do you have critical infrastructure needs and, and, a, and a critical load that needs to be preserved in the event of an outage? I was actually just talking to a semiconductor uh, company last week that I, it was interesting to learn that the, the outages are not just decreasing productivity during the outage, but it can actually take an entire plant offline for months. Um, in, in this semiconductor process, they have um, molten product that's, that's flowing through. And if they lose power and that product then has a chance to solidify, it can actually not just damage the product that's flowing through the, the, the equipment, but it can damage the equipment itself. And you'd actually have to pull that out and replace the whole equipment. Um, and when we saw this, some examples, we saw um, the, the example with Samsung losing hundreds of millions of dollars in the deep freeze in Texas. Uh, and then another important one is what are your customer commitments? Where well, you mentioned before the scope three, um, your customers, you are part of your, your customers scope three emissions. And we've already heard this in the automotive side of the world where the automakers are pressing their uh, parts suppliers to decarbonize. And in fact, one key example was that um, uh, an automaker for some of their electric vehicles was asking their supplier to, to, to promise to be net zero by 2025, at least for the lines that were producing their parts um, in this plant, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, last couple ones to, to touch on, constraints. So how much space do you have? Oftentimes, roofs are covered with equipment and air handling units and all kinds of stuff. So do you have parking lots? Do you have uh, adjacent land? Or do you have a great roof that maybe was replaced in the last couple of years and we'd want to consider it? Do you have space for uh, pads to, to house batteries? Or do you have gas connections for, for uh, gas generators? These are all important uh, components to, to take in mind. And then understanding the cost to deploy different technologies um, and the labor associated with deploying those technologies. These are all local concerns. And when you're talking about hundreds or thousands of sites, um, trying to account for each individual local concern if you're doing this with a spreadsheet, you're just not going to be able to pull it off. So, um, Gareth, tell us a little bit more about how how we think about this at Vecta. Yeah, no, it's been a really good summary, Dan. I think you know, we've covered what are the key questions on our customers' minds, what are the variables they need to be considering when exploring the opportunities across their portfolio. And I think what I'd add is you know, some of those variables are static and they're never going to change. You know, the amount of roof space you've got is not going to change, but your utility chat tariffs could be changing multiple times a year. The cost of fuels are going to be changing. So incentives, as you alluded to, are changing. So being on top of the dynamic nature of the market is super important. A vector, we uh, 
we are firm believers in kill bad projects early and often. You know, we are all time, resource, and cost constrained. So we need to make sure as an in industry and as businesses that we're investing our precious resources into the highest return on investment opportunities. And return on investment, to our point earlier, can be cost, it can be resilience, it can be emissions, whatever your metric may be. But the key to this is let's ensure we are prioritizing the highest quality opportunities and investing our time into that. And you know, to do this, we need to consider all those variables you talked about, Dan. But getting access to some of this data can be super hard, especially for organizations with complex, deep portfolios. And so our belief is let's start with the minimalist amounts of data and help our customers make a go no go decision on the highest potential projects and so we do that by collecting a site address and an industry type and using just those two data points alone we're able to one determine through the industry type what their typical energy consumption profile should look like and then from their location, we can then pull insights into all the variables you talked about, Dan, utility tariffs, outage rates, emission profiles, um, the cost of deploying these systems from an equipment and construction perspective, which vary massively across um, locations. And so we pull about 5,000 different data points per um, location. We actually run an optimization behind the scenes in a matter of minutes. You know, as a consultant, this process would have literally taken us months to years and it would have been really painful. And so immediately we're able to then present to our customers, here's all the data and insights around incentives you qualify for, where the projects are going to have the greatest IRR return on investment. We actually do our own internal scoring system. So we give each project a vector score. So we rank can rank by any of these variables. And then what that allows us to do is then prioritize where we want to spend our time and energy. And so we'll talk about where we go to on a future episode from here. But I think the big key takeaway is on-site energy, as we've talked about in past episodes, can generate a huge amount of opportunity for your business. Knowing where to deploy these systems, how to deploy them, and who to deploy them with is the big question our customers start with. And the key to this is making sure across a vast portfolio of facilities that we really prioritize where are we going to realize the greatest return? Because once we've got that return, we can reinvest that savings, that opportunity into the next project, and then we build compounding value. And the market is dynamic and the situation is changing all the time. And so just because a project may not pencil today doesn't mean 6, 12, 18 months from now, it, it's not a, an amazing opportunity. And so being able to stay on top of these dynamic variables in real time and get insights into what's possible and where you should be truly developing these projects is critical. So Dan, do you want to close us out and give us a summary? Yeah, absolutely. I think the 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 big takeaways are are really there's there's a, a vast amount of information that that needs to be considered here, um, some of which is is at a at a portfolio or organizational level, but most of which is at a local level. And every location is going to be very different. Even um, even sites that are within the same county are going to be subject to um, to to different incentives and 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 different uh, different utility constraints. And so. Uh, I think that, that it's important to zoom in at a local level, um, but do, being able to do so at scale. And uh, the, as you said, the opportunity is massive. And the number one thing, um, as I was thinking through this, the, 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 the number one job of business leaders, and, and certainly if you go all the way to the top, the number one job of, of C-level and, and CEO business leaders is prioritization. Every business has... A, a massive amount of things that they could focus on, but there's only so much time. There's only so much resources to to focus. I think Steve Jobs said it. He said, your success is going to be determined by the things that you say no to rather than the things that you say yes to. So back to kill bad projects early and often. I think it's imperative that when we go on this energy transition, it is extremely complex. There's so many different things that you could focus on, but where are you going to maximize today where you spend your time and resources. And then as you, over time, the dynamic nature, some companies that might be towards the middle of your list are gonna pop up to the top of the list, or as you check check sites off of, of the top of the list, you start working your way down, but you're doing so in a way that's gonna maximize the opportunity, whether that's um, financial, whether that's decarbonization or whether it's operational resilience. So I think the, the, the key takeaway is, is focusing on the things that matter, 
and prioritize because that's what we should all be doing as business leaders. So uh, that's awesome. good to be good to be digging into it, and uh, and we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll kind of move on to the next phase of where we go from here in future episodes. Yeah, that's great. Now that we've prioritized the portfolio, what do we do with the the top sites? We'll cover that in the next one. Good stuff. Plan. Catch you next time, Dan. See ya. We receive a lot of questions from business leaders around the world wanting to learn more about the energy transition, what is possible and where to start. So to help you stay informed and up to date on best practices, opportunities, risks and success stories, we created an industry news feed at vector.com forward slash news with all our podcasts, blogs and newsletter. Check it out and connect with Dan, myself and the Vector team to learn more. Cheers and have a good one.